Let me remind you, in case you uh, join us late online uh, or late in the house, it's great to see everybody here in the house, by the way, uh, we are going to have an outdoor service next week. So we are excited. It is going to be right behind me on the other side of this wall. So we have the whole backyard, which is pretty big, to accommodate everybody. So un- unless you are in the highest, you know, danger zone, we would love for you to, uh, to join us. I encourage you to bring your own chairs. We will have some metal chairs if you want to sit in metal chairs. Uh, but if you want to sit in comfortable chairs, well, you know, Academy is your place. So uh, we want to just encourage you to come regular time. We'll park out here, walk around the back side of the building over here. This side over here to my left and your right will not be accessible, okay? So we're going to have that blocked off. Only way in or out is over here unless you come through the woods. I don't recommend it. It's kind of weird uh, when we've got a wide open space. But different folks, different strokes for different folks. Anyway, join us next week. We are excited about this. I am pumped about this. So we are, uh, we are poised for it. We're going to do some preparation for it. It ought to be pretty exciting. Uh, we will probably have to learn through it as well. So if you're expecting perfection, that is never a good thing to, to expect. So join us for that. Uh, today, as we continue this series in Mark, uh, I'm excited about this because it, it is one of those little, very brief passages that uh, it, it's usually looked at one-dimensional. I want us to look at it a little more three-dimensional in terms of, of its purpose and its application. Because quite often, we simply look at this passage and go, ah, yes, Jesus got up in the morning, you should too. All right, that is a great application point. That application point will be made, uh, but we're not going to just stop there and move on. Today so far, we have sung about God being, about Jesus being sovereign, Jesus being good, and Jesus never forsaking us. This passage also tells us that Jesus never forsakes us. You might go, wait a second, that, that doesn't sound like what we just read. It sounds like Jesus went away. It sounds to me like Jesus was forsaking everybody and going off by himself because he was tired of the crowd. Because if you'll remember where we left off last week in the passage, Jesus had finished at the synagogue, went over to Simon and and Andrew's house for a little R&R, going to have a little lunch, going to hang out for a while. But immediately when he walks in the door, he's confronted with an illness, and it's Simon's mother-in-law. And so... Jesus said once, goes, he's told about it, and he goes to her, and he heals her. He lifts her up off of the, didn't lift her up, but he takes her hand, raises her up, helps her up, and she begins to serve. So we see that dynamic of not only showing he had restored her 100% completely. She was feeling great. She got up to serve everyone. But also it demonstrates what the response is when Jesus ministers to you when he comes into your life and he changes and transforms you. It is a call to service. It's a call to response. We'll see that a little bit today. And then after that, of course, everybody came. Uh, It wasn't the cooking. I mean, it wasn't like they smelled, oh man, uh, Peter's mother-in-law is cooking again. Let's go. Everybody came after the Sabbath was complete because their priority at that moment was we got to make sure we cross all the T's and dot all the I's, make sure we get everything just right. Then we'll go see Jesus when Jesus says, come to me now. Come to me as you are. Come to me sick and ill and messed up. Come to me with all of your brokenness. Come to me with your pain, with your struggles. Come to me with your challenges in your life. Come to me now. Don't wait to try to get everything just right. Don't wait until everything fits what you think should happen to come to me. But come to me if you are weary, if, you are, if you're heavy laden, if you're burdened, if you're struggling, if you're, if you're dying. Inside, come to me. And they did, by the droves. It says that the entire town came, and they were at the door. Uh, We're going to see some other cool stuff from that point afterwards, what they do when they came to crowd around the house. But, But so Jesus began to heal them. He began to cast out demons. Those were two separate things, but both were demonstrating an inbreak of the kingdom of God into a broken world, where he overcomes... The strong man, he overcomes the evil one in this world and he does it by just casting them out. And then in a separate but equal thing, he demonstrates his power and his love and his compassion by healing. Healing sickness, casting out demons, preaching that the kingdom of God is at hand. And so Jesus had a long day. All of that was all in one day from the beginning of the synagogue all the way to the end. 
where into the night he's healing people. Because it was already after dark when they came. So we don't know how long they were there. But if it was a whole town, who knows? But in this verse, we're told that very early in the morning while it was still dark, there are two things that mean the same thing. Very early in the morning while it was still dark. Now, I think that's important. Because some of you think very early in the morning is 10 a.m. Right? I mean, that's, anything earlier than 9, it is very early but while it was still dark, was to help us understand that Jesus got up really early. Really before everyone else would. He got up when everybody else would be snoring, hitting the alarm clock over and over and over. Where you've got that annoying sound. You know what I'm talking about? You've got it. If you're married, you know it because your spouse has it. And it's like constantly, ten times, it's like, get up already. But Jesus is already up. And says he's gone off into a desolate place. Now, what I want to focus here on is three, there are three kind of movements here. What we have in 35, we see a movement. We have another emphasis in 36 and 37 and then 38 and 39. And so what I want us to look at here is how, first of all, Jesus prioritizes prayer. He prioritizes prayer in verse 35. And then in 36 and 37, prayer prioritizes Jesus' ministry. Now what I mean by that is it sets the priority of his ministry. It keeps him focused. Prayer keeps him focused. And then prayer, I'm sorry, it keeps his ministry focused. And then Jesus' ministry prioritizes the Father's will. 38 and 39. So we're looking at Jesus prioritizes prayer. Prayer prioritizes Jesus' ministry. And Jesus' ministry prioritizes the Father's will. Now I want to look at this in terms of what this meant for Jesus and again, not skipping to this quick application, we'll get there. But what Jesus' focus and why, why it meant so much to him, how that affects us and why that should mean so much to us in light of who Jesus is, not just in light of what we're supposed to do. Because if we go there, that we're going to talk about how, we're going to think about, oh man, I need to be praying more. I need to be having a quiet time more. I need to do this. And then before we even know it, we're checking off boxes, right? We're starting to feel guilty because we're not praying more, because we're not spending more time in the Word, because we're not having our quiet time. And so we get back into that vicious cycle of do better and you'll be better. The focus here is Jesus has done it. You are better because he's accomplished something. And it's not about what you should do. It's about who you should be in light of who he is. And it's who you should be because it's who he's making you into it. So I'm not brushing all of this off and saying we have no responsibility whatsoever. But I am making sure we have this in context that this is not about checking boxes. I do not want you to leave here thinking, I just need to be praying more, man. I mean, I, I, I mean, that's okay if you do think I need to be praying more, but not because I need to because I feel guilty because I'm not doing enough. Because God doesn't love me if I'm not praying enough, if I'm not, if I'm not reading my Bible enough. Jesus still loves you. He has so much more for us, but his love for you is not going to change based on that. Do you, do you understand? It's a, that's a crazy con, but that's grace, man. That's grace. Grace doesn't make any sense because it seems to me like if I disappoint him, he ought to boot me out the door. But the Bible says he doesn't. That he loves me more. He, he throws in more grace to me at that point. And that's what makes it amazing. I mean, it's truly amazing. Because I would have kicked you out. I would have thrown you out, out the door if you neglect me. But he's, his love is so much better, so much richer, so much greater. So I want us to see it in terms of that. But then also what it means for the body of Christ today. What it does mean for the church. And what the church can both experience more of and also be more of in the community around us, in the world around us that is crying in desperation for something and they don't know what. And they're frustrated and their frustrated is pouring out into the streets. There's so much going on that the church can be a part of the solution if we have the power to do so. So that's our focus. And so we're going to start here in verse 35 with Jesus prioritizing prayer. He goes to a solitary place. Now the interesting thing about the solitary place is that 
it is, it says deserted place in the CSP. It's all the same because the focus here and the same word is used for the word wilderness. It's the same word that's in the very beginning where, where, uh, Mar, where John the Baptist is in the wilderness. It's the same concept of Jesus going into the wilderness after he uh, was baptized and before he started his ministry. It's where he went into the wilderness to be tempted. So we have this, this concept of the wilderness, the desolate place. It's not in terms of vegeta vegetation. It doesn't matter uh, because Capernaum at this time, it was well cultivated. So it's very unlikely that he went into a desert place, but he went into a deserted, desolate. He's away from everybody. No cell phones, no computers, no people that are, that are knocking on the door constantly. He goes to a place that is desolate. He is out where, uh, where no one else is around. And that's why, it, as you heard earlier as this passage was read, it took so long for him to be found. Because he was in a place that wasn't the first place you would look. Good on Jesus. It's good to find those kind of places. Right? So, what this does is it reminds us of how important the desolate places are in our lives and why we shouldn't rush out of them. And sometimes, why we need to rush into them. So, quite often in our lives, desolate places or wilderness type experiences are those places that are very difficult, where it's dry, it, it's, it's hard, it's... It's not somewhere we want to be. And so we do everything we can to get over it as quickly as possible. Now, that's good. You know, it's, it's not like we want to stay in a wilderness, desolate place any longer than we have to in that context. But we do it in terms that are not in keeping with what God has for us and our sanctification. And so we just like rush out of it and try to get it, try to fix the problem. But that's not the biblical concept of what was going on in, uh, uh, in the wilderness time of experience. The wilderness is often the place that God takes his people to prepare them, to protect them, to woo them to himself, to give them rest or even give them power. All of those are part of God's plan. I've talked about this before, so this is probably not a new concept if you've been with us for a long time. Um, but the wilderness is, is what God really focuses on probably more than anything. He's the God of the wilderness. He's the God where he takes us away from everything. He takes us into places where, where we have to wrestle with things. We have to deal with things. We have to come face to face with our issues. We come face to face with who Jesus is. The wilderness is an uncomfortable place to be, but it is an important place to be. Uh, in part one of this series, I pointed out that the wilderness was often identified in the Old Testament as a place of repentance. And therefore a place of grace where we experience more of Jesus, where he calls us to repentance. It's the place where God brings deliverance for his people. I want to point out several passages here uh, that, that indicate different ways that the, the wilderness or the desolate place, the deserted place, is used by God to bring about his purpose. If we look in Exodus chapter 13... Verses 17 through 18. These are two verses that had a tremendous impact in my life when I was going through a very deep, dark wilderness time many years ago now. And how this, these two verses and this concept just changed, it rocked my world and changed my, my projection. It changed my direction. It changed my focus and my attention. Because I was wondering, Lord, where are you? Are you doing anything? Have you forgotten me? Have you, have you just, have I done something to, to disqualify myself in some way? And I'm, I'm reading this in context of a Bible study with another group. And this is when God calls the children out of, the de out of Egypt. And he takes them to the wilderness. And here's the explanation. Verse 17. When Pharaoh let the people go, God did not lead them along the road to the land of the Philistines, even though it was nearby. Even though, in other words, it made sense. Just take him to the land of the Philistines. It's on a road. It's easy. Go. You can be there by dinner time. That's the easy way to go. That's not what God did. For God said, the people will change their minds and return to Egypt if they face war. So he led the people around toward the Red Sea along the road of the wilderness. And the Israelites left the land of Egypt in battle formation. Several things that I think are, are important in that. Again, it's not the quick and easy road. It's the way of the Philistines is the quick and easy road. But it's not the right road for the right time. Now interestingly, they would eventually face the Philistines. They would defeat them, but not then. God had, had 
taken them in a direction of the wilderness to prepare them for that day. They would take the land, that day that they would face the enemy. That day they would face the enemy and defeat the enemy, but that was not the day it was going to happen because when they saw that at that point in their life, in that stage of their development, they were going to turn and run back to Egypt. How crazy is that? How crazy? Because they're kind of between a rock and a hard place. They go, well, we know Egypt. We know what we get there. It's not easy. It's not fun. It's not Holiday Inn. But at the same time, Philistines, man, they're tough. They, are, they, are, they have a reputation and they will destroy us. And so God says they'll see them and they'll go back to Egypt. That's not my purpose. I will prepare them during this time of wilderness for them to face the enemy and to take the enemy out. But it was also for their protection. Protection not from the Philistines because God can do anything he wants, but protection from themselves. When they saw the enemy, even though they were already equipped, it says when they went out, they went in battle formation. They were already ready for battle, but they were, they were not prepared internally. And so they needed to be protected from themselves and in the same time prepared. Prepared. I went through that, man. And that's, when, that, when that kind of bit me hard, then I was like, you know what? I could wait. I can wait because God's doing something. And, and through those two verses, God showed me, I have you, David. I've got you waiting right now in the wilderness. I've got you wandering around a little bit. I've got you questioning and asking. But you know what I discovered? The more difficult internally the wilderness became to me, the more I pressed into God. It started off by me getting angry at God. But you know the thing about, there's something about angry, anger. If you're in any kind of a relationship and you get angry at somebody, what does that mean? It means, number one, you believe. You believe that they are somebody worthy of being angry at, or at least they're somebody of import. And secondly, it means you care. If I am in a relationship and I don't, I'm not prepared to fight for anything, and I just, just, I'm done. That's the most dangerous place to be in a relationship. Because that's where you've gotten to the point where you're just like, I just don't believe that there's anything good in this. So I pressed in closer to who God was and I began to experience him more deeply. And it prepared me when I walked into these doors the very first time. God takes us into the wilderness to prepare us to protect us. He did it with Moses. Moses did, spent many years in the wilderness before he ever went to face Pharaoh. He did it with Elijah. He did it with Elisha. He did it with John the Baptist. Quite often, God would lead the people that he's going to use into the wilderness to get them ready. So don't run out of it really quickly. Wait to see what God's going to do. Secondly, Exodus 14, which is the next chapter uh, that we're looking at, verses 1 through 4. Uh, then the Lord spoke to Moses, tell the Israelites to turn and turn back and camp in front of Pi-Haharoth between Migdol and the sea. You must camp in front of Baal Zephon facing it by the sea. Verse 3, Pharaoh will say of the Israelites, they are wandering around in the land in confusion. The wilderness has them boxed in. The wilderness is the enemy. The wilderness is what's going to uh, bring us, the Egyptians, victory. But God says, I will harden Pharaoh's heart so that he will pursue them. Then I will receive glory by means of Pharaoh and all his army and the Egyptians will know that I am the Lord. God used the purpose, uh, the wilderness for the purpose of his own glory and displaying his power. Verse 10. As Pharaoh approached, the Israelites looked up and there were Egyptians coming after them. The, the Israelites were terrified and they cried out to the Lord for help. They said to Moses, it is because there are no graves in Egypt that you have taken us away to die in the wilderness? What have you done to us by bringing us, bringing us out of Egypt? Isn't this what we told you would happen? It's like, we told you so. And here we are, we're going to die in the wilderness. It would have been better for us to serve the Egyptians than to die in the wilderness. See, God knew what he was doing. That's what he said they would do. And that's exactly what they were doing. Verse 13, but Moses said to the people, don't be afraid. Stand firm and see the Lord's salvation that will accomplish for you today. I'm going to stop there because I think that is because of revelation of what God had said to him. But also Moses had had time in the wilderness. He came to understand God's purposes more because he had already been in the wilderness. Now he was going to lead them into the wilderness. Moses had been where he was leading the people and he knew God was there. He knew God was there. He had experienced God there. 
For the Egyptians you see today, you will never see again. The Lord will fight for you and you must be quiet. There's a time to be quiet in the wilderness. That's what desolate, desolate places are for. It's a place to be quiet. You look, you're out here. Be quiet and just listen for God. Listen to him. Learn to trust him. Learn of his deliverance. Isaiah 63 Verses 11 through 14, also speaking about the Israelites, Isaiah is looking back on this and he's talking about the love and the compassion of God. And when you think of all that the, the Israelites went through, it's like, really? Because it seemed like it was awfully hard. And yet, uh, in verse 9, uh, Isaiah says that he redeemed them because of his love and his compassion. And then over in verses 11 through 14, he says this, again, looking back on the time in the wilderness says, Then he remembered the days of the past, the days of Moses and his people, where he brought them out of the sea with the shepherds of his flock, where he put uh, his Holy Spirit among the flock. He made the glorious strength available to the right hand of Moses, divided the water before them to make an eternal name for himself, and led them through the depths of a whore, like a horse in the wilderness, so that they did not stumble like cattle that go down into the valley of the Spirit of the Lord. Uh, into the valley, the Spirit of the Lord gave them rest. You led your people this way to make a glorious name for yourself. Sometimes the, the wilderness is a place of rest. Sometimes it is a place where God just takes you out into the wilderness, into the desert place, into the deserted place, and he gives you rest. Sometimes that's not in the way that you think it should happen. But when you're done, he leads you out of that. There is refreshment because you have been in the presence of the Lord. It is a desolate place, but it is a good place. In Hosea chapter 2, God led his people into uh, a wilderness based on his love for, you, for them after they had turned on him, after they had adultered themselves is the way Hosea says it uh, from the Lord. They had cheated on God, but God says in verse 14, I am going to persuade her. He's talking about Israel. I'm going to persuade her, lead her to the wilderness and speak tenderly to her. There I will give her vineyards back to her and make the valley of Accor into a gateway of hope. There she will respond as she did in the days of her youth, as in the days she came out of the land of Egypt. God is saying, I love my people so much. I'm going to lead them out into the wilderness. I'm going to woo them out there to be with me. And it is through that process that God is going to restore. I'm going to restore my people. I'm going to restore to my people the blessings that I have for them. Don't rush out of the wilderness too quickly. Don't leave the desolate place too soon. Camp out there for a while and see what God has in store for you. Three times in Mark, Jesus goes to a solitary place. Here in verse 35, and then following the feeding of the 5,000, and then at Gethsemane, where he's praying before he goes to the cross. All three are times where Jesus is going out to preach or he's going to face opposition. Ultimately, of course, the, the opposition of the cross. But he's going to preach, so there's going to need to be power. He's going to the cross, so there's going to need to be power. He's going to need something, and so he does that. James Edwards says, Jesus cannot extend himself outward in compassion without first attending to the source of his mission and purpose with the Father. And conversely, his oneness with the Father compels him outward in mission. So Jesus can't, can't extend himself beyond what he has, uh, the, the power that he has received from the Father. And as he spends time with the Father, he's compelled outward into ministry. That's no different with us. But it says something about the heart of Jesus. That he would embrace the desolate place. So that he would spend time with the Father. And be compelled out into the ministry of the Father. Which is on our behalf. And it was where Jesus recharged and he renewed his power. This reminds me of Mark 9. And I'm not going to read all of this. Because I don't, just for the sake of time. But in Mark chapter 9. There is a really interesting thing that happens. Uh, with Jesus and his disciples. 
Because Jesus comes in, and if you're, if you're looking at it, it's starting in verse 14. I'm not going to read it all, though. Uh, but at the time that he comes to the disciples, there's a large crowd around them. And they're, they're arguing, they're bickering. And Jesus is like, what are, what are you arguing over? And then someone from the crowd said, hey, teacher, I brought my son to your disciples. Because my, my son, my child has an evil spirit. And it seizes him. He makes him grind his teeth. He becomes rigid. And I asked if your disciples could cast him out. But they couldn't. And Jesus, he gets frustrated at him. He, he's like, how long am I going to deal with this? You've been with me now for a while and I'm still having to deal with this. So they brought the boy to him. And when the spirit saw Jesus, it immediately threw the child into convulsions, whatever age he was. And so Jesus asked him, hey, how long has this been going on? And, and the man says, well, he's been from childhood. Many times it's thrown him into the fire. And it's been a, a huge issue for our family. It has tried to kill him. And so the man says, look, if you, if, you, if you can, can you do something? And Jesus is like, if you can, if I can? All things are possible for those who believe. And this is that famous line where the, boy, the father says, look, I believe, help my unbelief. And do you know what Jesus does? He helps his unbelief. And so he takes the, takes the boy and he, he casts out the spirit. Later, to skip ahead, later when the disciples come to Jesus, they're like, why, why couldn't we do that? And Jesus says something that takes us all the way back to where we are in Mark chapter 1. He said, this kind can come, can come out by nothing but prayer. The implication is Jesus had already prayed up, man. He didn't, did, I mean, Jesus didn't say, okay, y'all, I'll be right back. And he goes off to a desolate place <laughs> and for a minute. He's like, y'all, don't leave. And he goes and he prays up real quick. Jesus immediately deals with the issue. He casts the spirit out. What does that imply based on what we've heard so far? Jesus had already received the power. It was through that practice of being with the Father that he had the power to do that if if what we believe in Mark chapter 1 is true, that Jesus went to the Father relying on the Holy Spirit to get the power and the energy the, to get everything he needed to be able to do what he, what he was called to do. Yes, Jesus is God. I get that. But what we see over and over is Jesus relying on the Spirit of God to both give him direction and power. The Spirit of God ministered to Jesus while he was in the wilderness. Remember, it was, it was the Spirit who was there. The angels were there ministering. Jesus was receiving while he was doing the ministry. And the, con, the, the, the other side of that, you can tell I didn't have the word there. On the other side of that is Jesus' disciples clearly were not. They were not. So the question I had, now, now later we'll see that, that they, they got it. And the Spirit of God on them and they were ready at the moment, but they had spent more time with the Lord. They had learned the lessons of following Jesus. And the question I have for us is, have we? How much more power could the church experience if we prioritize prayer in a solitary place? How much power could we have? How much power do you want in your own life against the evil that is around you? I'm not saying to attack evil people. That's not where I'm going with this. Give us the power and we can take them out. No, the power to attack the enemy, the unseen enemy in your life. The power to be everything that God has called you to. How much do we want? Similarly, I would ask the question, what is your high, the highest of priority in your life? What is it? What does you want more than anything? And what determines that? What determines your highest priority? Is it, is it, stuff about yourself or is it stuff about the kingdom of God? Because this I know, even when I don't practice this fully myself, I know this to be true. That the more time you spend in the solitary place with the Lord, the more you will see your priorities shift towards God's kingdom, God's kingdom purposes. The less the amount of time you spend in the desolate place, the less you are going to have priorities that reflect the kingdom of God. And I should say, the more you will experience power over the sin that grips you, the more you spend time in the presence of God. But it also reminds me again, Jesus did this. Jesus did this 
to focus, prioritize, prioritize prayer so that prayer would prioritize his ministry so that the ministry would carry out the will of the Father which was to redeem a people to himself. Jesus did all of this for the glory of the Father and so that you and I could come boldly into the throne of grace. And that's praiseworthy. If we, if we take all the stuff that we're talking about us doing for our own uh, spiritual benefit just to look at Jesus and to go, Jesus did that for us. He denied himself. He went into a desolate place. He spent time with the Father because the battles were coming, because the preaching was going to happen, and he needed the energy, the power of the Spirit of God to, to in, uh, indwell and empower his words and his ministry. And so prayer prioritizes Jesus' ministry. Verses 36 and 37, back in Mark chapter 1 this is where Simon and his companions searched for him. And when they found him, they said, everyone is looking for you. Jesus prioritized, uh, uh, prayer prioritized Jesus' ministry. So his ministry, again, was an outgrowth of a close relationship with the Father. And it kept him on point. Peter and the others sought him out. But the word there is more powerful than just sought him out. They pursued him. They were after him. They were looking high and low for him. They looked everywhere they knew to look. And then they started looking in places they didn't know to look. And that's where Jesus was, where they didn't know that, they, that he would be. But as I've looked more into this, I, scholars have, have pointed out, I think rightly, that this demonstrates the, the, the opposite of what Jesus was doing. That which was contrary to spending time with the Father. Because these guys were driven by the opportunity to capitalize on Jesus' popularity. What'd they say? Everyone is looking for you. What are they looking for? What have they been doing? They had come to get healed and to experience uh, miracles. To, to get the show. They're looking for you. They want more of what you're offering. But here's the problem. What Jesus did in preaching the kingdom of God was to drive them to a point of decision on what they're doing with this kingdom. Are they going to pursue Jesus? Are they, are they seeing him as the Messiah that he is or the Messiah that they think he should be? Because let's keep in mind what the people were looking for when Jesus came. The Messiah they were looking for was the king who would come and liberate them from the Roman authority. Who would come and set up an earthly kingdom, which someday he will, but right now, that's not what he was about. That's what they wanted. They wanted more of that. And Jesus had to stay on point. Because if somebody came to me and said, hey David, everybody's looking for you. They want to hear you. They want to see you. Then what is, you know, I was like, that's awesome, man. All right, I'll be there. Shall I wear anything special? You know, what do, they, do they want? what do they want? You know, this is cool because it's all about me. I'm in the spotlight. Jesus could have easily done that and he could have been the king. They would have set him up as king. That's not what he was called to do. Time with the father made sure that he was prioritizing on the ministry. It was prayer that was prioritizing that ministry. This is not all that different from, from Peter's misunderstanding of Jesus in, eight, in chapter 8 where uh, Jesus explains what he's going to do and Peter says, no sir, uh-uh, you're not going to do that. Not on my watch. And Jesus has to rebuke Peter. Peter was getting in the way of the ministry that Jesus was called to. In this same passage, Jesus, I mean Peter is getting in the way of the ministry that Jesus is called to. Unlike that time where he, repu he, re he rebukes Peter openly, at this point he just redirects. He just like ignores it altogether. He's like, I'm not going there. Jesus was so focused on the mission. He had spent time with the Father that he was ready to just bypass that and stay focused, to stay on point. For us, without a mission determined and prioritized through prayer, it is going to be prioritized by whatever seems right in our own eyes. If we are not prioritizing prayer in our lives, then everything else is going to prioritize our lives. It made sense. It may, even when we look at it now, if you look at it, removed from what we know and, and, and spiritualizing everything because we're Christian people, uh, it, it made sense to kind of strike while the iron was hot. But popularity wasn't what Jesus was after. Time after time, he rebuked the spirits and said, don't talk about me. Don't, don't say who you know I am. 
Why? Because Jesus knew that that would limit his ability to minister among the people. It wasn't going to expand it. It wasn't going to make it better. It was going to make it worse. So there was this, this paradox here. He understood their misunderstanding of why he came. And every time that there is those who are seeking Jesus, it was either related to some form of, of obstruction to his ministry or to kill him, which ultimately, of course, would have been an obstruction to his ministry. Edward says, seeking connotes an attempt to determine and control rather than to submit and follow. So that's the picture that we get. And so let's look again. I want to keep calling us to this. Jesus is to be praised because of his focus on the mission determined by his commitment to the Father. Without that, you and I would have no hope. Jesus is to be praised because not for a moment would he forsake us. Not for a moment. Not at all. Jesus stayed focused and he was willing to deny himself in order to stay on mission so that we would have hope. Are you guided by a sense of mission obtained through deep relationship with the Father? Or are you driven by sheer opportunity? You know, it's just step back, you know, whatever door's open, I'm going through. That's not really the best way to go. That can be, that can absolutely be. But the question that we have to ask is, and the, the answer that comes the more we are in prayer about something, is a door might open and the Spirit of God compels us to do nothing. To stand still because even though that door looks good and that seems like the right opportunity, the Spirit of God says that's not the right opportunity even though it looks like it. Sometimes God may be walking, calling us to walk in faith towards a closed door. The key is hearing from the Father through the Spirit that ministers. Even if it looks like a perfect opportunity. It can also mean walking through a door that everyone else tells you is a mistake. I ain't going back to the story again about how I got here. But everybody here said it was a mistake. Even Brenda. Who are you listening to? Jesus would have been misled by those who were closest to him. Sometimes you can too. Those who are closest to you, only through prayer can you determine what counsel you need to listen to, what voices you need to hear. On the flip side, only prayerfully will you be in a position to counsel others. Otherwise, your source of authority when somebody comes to you with a problem is going to be, well, it seems the best to me to, and that's the key, it seems best to me. Not coming from the perspective of, man, I really believe that the Spirit is encouraging this. Put yourself in a position to be used. And then finally, verses 38 through 39, Jesus' ministry prioritizes the will of the Father. Notice again, Jesus didn't really even answer the apostles regarding Capernaum. He didn't answer them. He just went right past it. And I love the confidence that Jesus has in his purpose. He just says, let's go to the neighboring villages so I can preach there. This is why I've come. This is why I'm here. It was a twofold purpose. It was to preach the redemptive good news of reconciliation and and to introduce the kingdom to a broken world. But he had absolutely uh, a certainty of his purpose. Lane says this, acts of healing and expulsion of demons, as much as proclamation, entailed a disclosure of the nature of the kingdom of God. And here's what I was talking about before. And it constituted a demand for decision. That is why Jesus interrupts the miracles to go elsewhere to proclaim the gospel of God. His purpose is not to heal as many people as possible as a manifestation of the kingdom of God drawn near in his person, but to confront men with the demand for decision and the perspective of God's absolute claim upon their lives. All of that to say... Jesus' ministry is to present the kingdom of God, to draw people to himself, call for a, for a decision because of the fact that there is a great demand that is placed on your life. Where when you hear that voice and you know, I am not where I need to be, and you respond, it is to give it all up. Because wouldn't that be cool to have the same sense of purpose that Jesus did? 
Hey, this is why I've come. Do you ever kind of go, I don't know why I'm here. I have no idea. That is most likely because you've spent less time with the Father. And that's, that's where, that's why this is not about checking off a box that that's done, but it's who am I called to be? What power am I supposed to have? And more collectively, who are we as the church supposed to be? Jesus' purpose is to attack the strong man's house and to rescue the captives. That's what he was doing. He was not going to be sidetracked until that was accomplished. And that's what we see in 39. He went into all Galilee, preaching in their synagogues, driving out demons. Uh, and, and then he goes into another, another uh, a miracle there, another, another thing that he was going to do to demonstrate this. At first glance, consequences don't seem that terrible, honestly. He could have stayed. He could have continued healing, exercising demons, grown in fame. But that's exactly what Jesus had to guard against. And that's what we have to guard against as well. Knowing where we're called. Knowing that we uh, are, are called not to build ourselves up or to build our own kingdom. But to empty ourselves for the sake of the kingdom. Jesus denied the temptation of self-aggrandizement so that the real kingdom could be established through, the, through very different means. And that was through completely emptying himself of his own desires and rights that were his and humbly going to a cross. Man, do you know, do you know what you're here for? Do you know what God is calling you to? Are you a part of that kingdom If you're not, then that's why Jesus came, was to call you into that kingdom. To call you out of your own kingdom, of trying to build your own world the way you want it to happen. And call you to give yourself up, because there's nothing short of that. It's sacrificing all, it's giving it all up. But it's being re replaced by adoption into the very family of God. Are you carrying out, if you are a part of that kingdom, are you carrying out your ambassadorship in the same manner of Jesus? And if we're not, we're in danger of, con of contributing to a counterfeit kingdom where, where our message is do more, try harder, where it is be a better person, whether it, where, where it is pick yourself up by your bootstraps, where it is be a better person, where it is all about self-help, and not about submitting yourself and laying down at the foot of the one who is making you into what he wants. Who is orchestrating your life step by step. That's what it means to be a part of the kingdom. That's what it means to say wherever I am and whatever I'm doing, I want it to be according to God's plan for my life. I want it to, do it, to be done according to his power. I want it to do, be done for his glory. And I want to see it done for those who God has come into the world to call into as a people, to himself as a people for himself. Do you ever spend time in the desolate place? If not, I want to encourage you to do that. This I want, to, I want to encourage you to commit to do that. Not so that next week when you come in here, I can go, hey, did you do it? Show of hands. Let me see. Let me see. Did you do it? Mm, I didn't think so. But so that you can spend time in the wilderness, experience the Father's love for you, so that you can be about the Father's work, so that you can be on point, so that you can know why you're here and what you're called to do, and so that you can spend time with Jesus. That's what this is all about. Mark's purpose is to reveal Jesus as the Son of God who loves you. And the person who loves you is the person who wants to spend time with you, and the person that you love is the person you want to spend time with. Are you doing that? If not, you're just missing out. Let's pray together.